We're back with another crossover episode from Show Me Your Tech Stack series, and it's a powerful one. I spoke with Will Griffin, digital marketing and e-commerce manager at Sophistaplate. It's an upscale entertainment and home goods brand. Will shares his secret recipe for scalable growth with a small marketing team, something that a lot of you can relate to. Uh, we chatted influencer marketing, channel-specific um, experiences, and how they're approaching alternative payment solutions. Interesting stuff. So I hope you enjoy this crossover episode with Show Me Your Tech Stack Meets the Conversion Show. Let's get going. Welcome to the show. This is our second episode of our series of Show Me Your Tech Stack. Today, we're with Will Griffin from Sophisticate, and I'd like to welcome Will to the show. Thanks for having me, Eric. Appreciate it. All right. Why don't we just kick off real quick? Can you just share with the, the, the crowd here uh, what you do at Sophisticate and, and what, what you offer? Sure. So at Sophisticate, I manage all things digital marketing and e-commerce and everything that falls within that realm. Uh, Sophisticate itself, uh, what we do is we sell and provide kind of... Um, fancy looking and elegant looking disposable tableware for uh, to set a nice table at your brunch, at your dinner, at your family event, uh, paper plates, napkins, cutlery. We also have a, a line of um, charcuterie boards, nice laser engraved North American source charcuterie boards. And really everything we do, everything we talk about is um, you know, easy elegance, try to make it really easy to host an event. You know, our kind of our mission is uh, to bring people together from all walks of life to break bed together. Uh, the business actually started with uh, it's a father and son uh, ownership group, and they always had fancy Thanksgivings. They always would blow it out, but they were kind of tired of doing so many dishes. <laughs> so they tried to, the next year, they decided to go disposable. They really couldn't find anything that was like elegant enough for like a Thanksgiving dinner. So they started making their own, and, and that's where we're at. So Sounds like an entrepreneurial family story. Oh, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, based out of San Diego? Uh, the business itself is technically who headquartered out of Atlanta, but we're kind of uh, right. a remote group. So the warehouse in the, um, is all in Atlanta, but I'm in San Diego. Our creative team and our executive team is up in LA. We have people in Bend, we have people in Chicago, we have people in the Carolina. So we're kind of I recall around. looking at your shipping information page, the hub was out of Atlanta, Georgia. Everything's yeah. out of, yep, College Park, Georgia. Yeah. College Park. Um, we're just coming off the 4th of July weekend here in the United States. So you must have you must have had a pretty good run there on your inventory. Yeah, the, the summer months are always kind of an, an important uh, season to, to capitalize on. So we have a lot of 4th of July, red, white, and blue sort of barbecue backyard wear. So um, yeah, we always do well in the, in the June, July time frame. So. All right. So we're here today to talk about your MarTech stack. Uh, what I'd like, to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just run through a quick laundry list of what you currently have, and our goal is not to run through each one. I just want to throw it all out there, and then uh, I'd like to talk about some of, more of the kind of like business operational behind the scenes stuff. So correct me if I'm wrong. If looking at your tech stack, we're looking at Shopify, Klaviyo, Postscript, AfterShip, One Click Upsell, which is now I believe being replaced by Zipify, uh, Judge Me. Uh, Bilio for your UGC, gorgeous customer service. Um, uh, friend buy, it sounds like you may have moved away from recently. Uh, are, are there any other major ones I might be missing from there? Oh, I mean, there's certainly, you know, other things that the, maybe the back end of the warehouse is doing, but if we're thinking about like Mar MarTech, you know, Zipify pages helps me build stuff. We have some volume discount apps to kind of help our discounting on our website. Obviously there's Just Do Know that we're using as well. Um, and, you know, from there, it's, you know, an app here or there to sort of accomplish one or two tasks. So started using some of the new Shopify things they went down with Shopify flows and audiences, but, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, CJ De Guara from eBoost, that was one of his, his recommendations. And in honor of CJ, my last guest, uh, we like to do something where we, we ask our prior guests, ask the next guest. So CJ has a question for you, which I'm going to lead off with. Which, which is, if you could do only one thing in the next 30 days, that would, it would take about, you know, five to 10 hours. This is the only thing you do within your, your business. Um, where would you allocate your time? So this could be, you know, focusing on the customer experience, optimizing your current apps, replacing apps, um, 
you know, the operations internally, the analysis of them. Where would you love to spend your time the next 30 days if it was one thing? Um, <laughs> that's hard because there's so many things to get done that, are, that seems so important. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I think um, one of the things that I'd really like to do that I haven't been able to do in the short term is really work on sort of the website's flow and feel. So for example, a lot of our charcuterie boards, it's a really important category for us to push going into Q4. And it's not the greatest customer experience right now because it's a custom widget. You gotta, you gotta kind of design it yourself. Really all the images need to be swapped out to make it a little bit uh, prettier, make it really easy to come in, see what it is you're gonna get and customize it. So for those, for that product line to really kind of take off, we really need to look at how the customer is interacting with the the kind of custom widget in that product line and um and really optimize it so i would spend 10 to 15 hours on on just that product category and making that look really really nice on the website that makes sense um yeah. obviously if you you did you'd feel you'd see the roi which which gets into another question of you know as you're whether it's this product are you looking at at what apps would you use? What technology would you use to make that happen? Yeah, we don't have really a big like internal development team. So most of the stuff that uh, I need, an app needs to come in and needs to do either a, a, a task or a, an item um, or a, a workflow it needs to kind of, it needs to go in and do that and needs to do it well. So really when I'm looking at our ROI on anything we add is like, is this going to help drive revenue? Is this going to help you know, save us time. It's just going to help me, you know, make my life easier. Um, mm -hmm. You know, kind of those are the three boats. And even when I look at ROI, there's different ways to look at at least a revenue ROI. There's pure dollars, there's conversion rate, there's customer lifetime value. So, you know, as we look at whatever piece of tech we bring in, it's like, you know, does, uh, does it add under the, does it add, does it add value into one of those buckets is, is kind of always the calculation. And then and, and there's, there's so many free ones now too. Then you guys start to think about, is this going to slow the website down? You know, this random app we had. So it's all, it's all a, a balancing act. So as we look at your role, you know, digital marketer, e-commerce manager, I'd kind of like to get into the, the processes within your business and your day, your day to day, because that's where a lot of digital marketers right now, I feel like are, are really underappreciated in the sense that how much impact you're making on not just driving leads, but the entire business all the way through. And with, with you know, there's an app, as we were saying earlier, you know, there's an app for that. Um, and so the, I, we're call, I'm kind of calling the techno savvy digital marketer, uh, people, growth marketers, whatever the title is, is you have your hands in a lot of different aspects of the business from with these, with these apps, you now are techno savvy. You, you can spin up an app, you can operate it. You don't need a developer. And you know you are also, that app is integrating with all your other apps. So you're managing this whole technology stack along with owning the KPIs, but you know, there's a lot going on. Um, with, with that, you know, let's say you're looking at this project next, next month, are you, do you have the ability to just make that happen or do you need, you know, executive buy-in? What's, what's going on behind the scenes for you to, you know, spend those five to 15 hours to make that happen? Yeah. I mean, I certainly have the authority to go and, and make the updates that I need to make. We, I certainly have conversations with our executive team, you know, daily. So we're all kind of on the same page in the overall North star of the business. Um, I mean, in general, you know, we're trying to build this this DDC retail side of the business from from really nothing. But the company itself has always kind of been a wholesale side of the business up until really the pandemic when we started spending money on the on the, the DDC side. So building that whole side of the business is you know we start small and we start uh, implementing this and we start implementing that and then you tweak this and you tweak that um, and then so it's it's also I guess a balancing act of like. I'm down in the weeds today and I'm, I'm listing, I'm, I'm creating a bunch of new listings for a bunch of our fall products. And then I need to go and create a bunch of the Clavio emails to kind of schedule those out. But then at some point I need to kind of get out of those weeds and get a little bit higher to make sure I understand 
okay, we have, we added this app. We have, we have just, you know, popping up on the website that's hitting these four different segments of, of visitors, depending on where they come from. Where did those contacts go into the whole flow further down the funnel? I mean, I just erased my whiteboard today so that I could go in and get out of the weeds and start kind of mapping out how everything sort of fits together. Cause you can really add all these apps and then things can feel fragmented. And then depending on how big your, big your team is, you can start to lose track of the customer journey and thus, you know, people churn out. So that was a pretty um, rambling answer, but no, no, I mean, so. you know, it, it, what people don't, what outsiders don't understand and having lived in, in, inside retail, and been in your position is you're in the trenches. You know, retail is a brutal industry. And as you have to be constantly updating your strategies and being on the cutting edge of how to market your product. And now it's what's most important is how to deliver your product, and how to communicate with your customer throughout the entire, entire journey. Uh, and the customer experience on the website is just one key component of closing that business, especially if you want repeat business. Uh, you know, I see you're using Aftership, the ability to communicate with your customer that the order is shipped, arriving, arrives what they ordered so that you can then get, hit them with follow-up emails with your ask for a review. You want a positive review and then you want that second purchase, which it hits your revenue goals. You know, meanwhile, you're top of the funnel driving the awareness. And if we kind of step back, I, I, you know, I loved your name first hit my radar during the, the webinar um, on where we we're discussing TikTok users. And I loved what you said about how you like to work to try to understand the channel. You mentioned your four segments where visitors were coming in and try to repl replicate that experience on the site. So if someone's on TikTok and they come in, we, we should understand that and we should try to reinforce that experience on site to carry them through the funnel. Um, I thought that was a really interesting, uh, you know, concept. I'm kind of curious, you know, where you are today. That was probably six months ago, um, maybe a year, who knows, <laughs> um, you know, where you are with, with those four segments or, you know, that example of a, a TikTok user coming in. Yeah. I mean, that sort of, uh, ideology is, is easier said than executed probably. And it's, uh, you know, I still think we do a fairly good job of um, understanding where the customer came from, whether that be an Instagram post, our, our TikTok is really small at the moment, but, you know, we're starting to play with it, whether they came from Pinterest, whether they came from um, a Google, a Google um, search or whether they, they, they engaged with Just Uno or they didn't, whether they're returning a buyer. So it's really just a matter of trying to segment those audiences and then trying to understand the message that's resonating with them. So whether that is, you know, maybe, maybe we should put some dance videos on our products for anybody that's coming from TikTok. But, uh, you know, people that are coming from Instagram are seeing big, flowery, big images. So trying to make sure that that's front and center when they come to the site. People that are searching it on Google, they're seeing really just a link. So when they come in, let's make sure that that, that information is sort of featured, uh, the, the text is sort of featured because that's more or less what drove them there. Um, and then depending on the type of product they've seen, you know, what other products can we see them throughout their journey on the website as well? You know, maybe they've seen, um, they've seen some product and other people tend to be buying it from this. And honestly, we, we have, we notice a different type of customer for people that are looking at our paper plates versus people that are working, looking at our, our cutting boards and they don't necessarily always overlap. So we even have two different types of customer coming to our website. So um, it's really just constantly trying to test the audience message or the message to that audience and then trying to adjust. You know, it's kind of so constantly tweaking. So I don't know if I, I don't know if we do it as well as I maybe articulated it yet, but um, yeah, that's you're really testing. Cool. Yeah. You know, and that's the thing. It's like, it's the constantly evolving. Something that was interesting you mentioned is uh, direct to consumer, how you were wholesale. And this is a new experience for your company. What, you know, in this, and what you said during the, so what, about two years into direct to consumer, if you started around, yeah, they really put started putting money behind the DDC channel in you know March of 2020. March of 2020. So you know, two years in, um, 
what's been kind of the standout learning curves for your business in terms of the, the technologies you thought you may need and you actually need and what you rely on to power that DT, DTC side of your business? Well, certainly, you know, the digital marketing, digital ads are important for that sort of top of funnel because we're growing it from, from really nothing. And, and while you can leverage some of the brand recognition that the wholesale side of the business has done for the previous several years, you still need to go and, and tell people that you're there. So, you know, leveraging digital marketing spends are important to get people to the site. And then even with the, and then with the iOS updates, it became even more important to make sure that we're kind of capturing these people that come to our site to either turn them into customers or, or turn them into you know, repeat customers continuing to come back. So um, for us, what's really driving it is that kind of top of funnel spend to get people to the site and then capture them with either with just Uno or with them making a purchase. And then they, we get them into our sort of marketing funnel where we can Uber segment our audiences in Clavio and Postscripts. And then um, <clears throat> from there, we develop new audiences and then throw them back up to the top of the funnel. So um, the, it's really that, that top of funnel is what's driving everything else. Uh, and then from there, it's about, <laughs> I guess, executing on, uh, on what we tell them that we have. So, Well, if I recall, you're, you know, with the iOS update, um, you know, you've stepped back a little from that spend because because of the changes to your ability to capture data with the first party and zero party data, what can you share the, how you're managing that by capturing and passing it? You know, you mentioned Clavio and PostScript, you know, the, the technologies and that flow of capturing that data. Sure. So, you know, as we drive traffic to the website, whether it's through digital spend or influencers or other or other means, um, even even trying to get on uh, different TV shows that feature our products. But as we drive traffic to the website, you know, we want to make sure that we're capturing that customer. And so Justina does a great job of people kind of opting in to email and SMS. And then from there, the, the, that customer gets thrown into a different segment. And then we have kind of different flows that'll drive them, whether that's a browse abandonment or an abandoned cart. Uh, if they purchase, there's a, there's, can we get the room review? And then they get into a flow of sort of path to VIP. How can I get them to their second or third purchase? Um, and then depending on how they've opted in, maybe they live in an SMS sort of world. Maybe they live in a uh, email sort of world um, in terms of, of us, of, of our touch points. <clears throat> um, it, yeah. I would say, you know, with the ver variety of these platforms and we're, we're talking KPIs, whether it's sales conversion, AOV, uh, repeat purchase. How are you internally tracking and reporting on that? And how often, you know, how closely are you looking at that? And as I recall, when, you know, when we were growing our retail business, we, we were growing, you know, 300% so fast, we didn't get into the minutia of the, the numbers. We were looking at the bigger numbers. Um, how closely are you tracking those KPIs and, and how? Yeah, a lot of the stuff we're doing is, is using either uh, Shopify's out-of-the-box reporting, some Google Data Studio stuff as well to sort of bring in the, bring in the stuff. Um, we're bringing the data. I'm looking at AOVs sort of every day. I'm looking at returning customer rate every day. And then from there, starting to calculate out the, the kind of the customer lifetime value. A lot of that stuff, I'm, I'm sort of pulling data into maybe Excel or Google Sheets and kind of manipulating it a bit to better understand it. I've used a few different things that sort of give me like a fancy dashboard, but you know sometimes those things break. So oftentimes it's um it's uh, I often it's, my, my my team sometimes hates me because oftentimes I'm like just put it in a spreadsheet, right? Just just I don't care. Just put it in a spreadsheet that that will work because you know these soft you know, some you know when we talk about Martech stacks. Sometimes, you know, everyone thinks this new one is going to solve all our problems. And every six months, there's a new one that gets replaced and you just start spinning your wheels at, at times. I would follow up. I would love an opportunity to look at that spreadsheet of yours <laughs> because oftentimes that's how the best software is built is you look at what people are doing manually and try to build a system around that. Um, so that, that's, I'm going to follow up on that one. That one's really good.
you know, well, it's certainly, certainly a task I need to do is figure out what it takes me too long to do and find a way to automate it. So, uh, yeah. yes. And yeah. that's what beautiful software can do. So, uh, yeah. I'm going to talk to you about that. Um, another thing that we had talked about when we talk about, you know, your, your goals and, and things you look at is site speed. And especially with, with your mark, mark, your entire stack, you know, every time you add it, add a new app, you have to consider this. What tools do you use to, to track your site speed? I use like Google Lighthouse a bit. They do a few things to sort of track the speed. Um, oftentimes I'll just um, go on to the website myself and on different devices and just kind of see how it's performing across Androids or tablets or here or there. We also use uh, Hotjar which does some stuff on like screen recording so I can see how customers yeah. are, are doing it. Um, and then, yeah, it's, it's Shopify itself also has the tool to sort of tell you how fast it's going and um, try to benchmark that against what other sites are doing and then um, look at it mobile and desktop, do whatever we can to sort of increase that speed. But you know, it's a it's a process. That's something we, you know, our team, our, our customer service side, receives a lot is like, hey, your app's slowing down on our site. So we'll go into, you know, the lighthouse and then GT metrics is a great one that uh, our tech team uses to, to analyze. Um, but it, it just goes into like, what happens kind of behind the scenes? Like how often do you say, do you think you are hopping into to check site speed and, or, or do you hear from other people on your team saying, hey, I think this is slowing down the site. It's weird. It's, it's, I don't hear much of it from customers. I don't hear much of it from internal. I think we've talked to other people that we know that run websites and, you know, some, some brands we have a faster speed according to Google and sometimes we have a slower speed and sometimes, you know, that's um, better than, you know, some, sometimes they're doing more revenue than us. Sometimes they're doing not. So <clears throat> it's really more of like, I, I know that when the site is moving faster, you know, the conversion rate tends to do, do better. So um, and uh, we honestly haven't had that many complaints from customers, but I guess who, who messages in saying that yeah. the site is too slow, right? Uh, but, you know, I can tell that, you know, it is clunky. It takes a little while. Um, it's, we just have a lot of images and we have new products every month. Uh, and it just kind of, it's been slowing stuff down. So, you know, that's when we start looking at what, what can headless commerce do for us? Is that something that, that we can do in? Is there a different theme we need to roll out? Is it upgrading to like Shopify Plus? Is that going to kind of help us get to that next level? Um, so those are all sort of the calculations that we look at, but well, you there's only so many things on the list. No, that's, that's the thing. It's that you know, we talk about achieving conversion excellence and what is that? And it's this long checklist that you're responsible for because, and it all ties together when it comes to site speed. You know, I imagine you might be responsible. You, you probably, I believe you work with an agency when it comes to your SEO. And, and any SEO person will tell you, well, let's look at your site speed. You know, let's see what yeah. Google says about your site speed. Um, it's, it is the reality of today's digital marketing. There's so many responsibilities on your plate, be a fancy one, disposable one, whatever it is uh, that you have to look at. Uh, do you, we mentioned images and I know you have videos on some of your product pages. Are you using any apps to kind of optimize those images? I mostly run it through Optimazilla. Optimazilla? Yeah, so I'll crop the image to the, the side we needed, or our design team will crop the image to the sort of the size that I request, and then um, we'll save it to the right size and run it through Optimazilla, which will kind of minimize it the best we can, and then, then we upload it to the site. But, you know, certainly that's, um, we're looking at a digital management kind of solution as well, because, again, the wholesale side of the business is a big catalog, but in general, it's a, uh, you download the image, you resize it, you save it, you put it in Optimizilla, you download it again, and you upload it into Shopify. It's uh, you know, that's a whole other process. But in general, trying to get the sites, the, the images on the website as optimized as possible. So yeah, I mean that's very uh, you know, 2007, the upload, download, run through, upload. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I bet there's an app for that. I um, hope so. The, uh, you also have YouTube, you have videos on your product page. I noticed they're hosted on YouTube. Um, is, are you just tying in from their, pulling in from their API on those? Yeah, we're just using the embed link or, or the link in general to pull that in. We haven't done much to push um, you know, YouTube advertising or anything like that. So, yeah, so speaking of, of product page, 
uh, payment. You know, it's more fintech, but you, I notice you have on the product page, you promote Google Pay, but then when you go to the cart, you can see that you have a, a wide variety of, of payment options. Uh, Shopify Pay, uh, really impressed with what they're building there. I think that is definitely um, a win for retailers, especially those trying to compete with Amazon for that ease of checkout. How are you, um, as you look at your cart, how's in terms of technologies, how is, um, you know, what's your view on all these different payment options? Well, it's, if you're definitely, if you're logging in and, and you're on the checkout page, like kind of anonymously, they'll show you like all of them, which, which can be like a lot, right? So, but if you're kind of logged in, like I think if I go in, it shows me like Apple Pay as a, as a solution. So, I mean, I think in general, the idea is to make it as frictionless as possible for somebody to sort of check out. Um, so you want, you, you'd like to have all the options on there, but then you kind of worry, are you, you know, it, it's like, it's like, even with the custom charcuterie board, like sometimes having too many options is, is overwhelming and it's, you freeze up and you don't know what to do. So, uh, in general for us, you know, we see even a decent amount of like referral traffic for, for like from Afterpay, for example. Um, so that's like, you know, for us, it's worth it there when you sort of do the math of what a, uh, different payment provider or payment method is, is doing to the website. So can you obviously back? different ones cost different much. Well, can you step back to that? Re you get biz referred business from Afterpay? Yeah. Afterpay kind of has their own, they have their own app, right? Where you can go in and you can see everybody that sells using Afterpay and people will go in there and our product will show up from time to time. And, you know, a big chunk of our referral revenue comes from people shopping on the Afterpay app. So um, is definitely. that that sounds exciting <laughs> it's definitely it's definitely uh nice because you didn't do much to, to sort of get that sale uh so we've looked at stuff like afterpay and like klarna which does something similar yeah. and they also have their own app um you know that's why we also started getting into to ltk which is more of an influencer thing but they have their own app where your product just sort of gets featured and then directs you back to your website so um really any way we can get in front of an audience that's looking to purchase is um so yeah you know, with afterpay that you know the buy now pay later markets really you know exploded how did can I ask how you made the decision on afterpay uh, i think it was pretty close between like afterpay and klarna but i think afterpay was maybe uh, a little more cost effective when we sort of launched uh we you know we were smaller we weren't doing as much revenue at the time so that cost was sort of um an important factor but they've sort of grown with us and they've been they've been here and we don't have any real issues so are there you know in terms of different apps are there any that you're currently looking at or excited like what are you what are you most excited about presently i was looking at tap cart a little bit um but i think about website speed especially for mobile like they tend i know it's like an app thing but you know we have a decent returning customer rate so that might be something there in, in terms of like engaging our returning customers even more and giving them a faster experience to rebuy. Uh, I was looking at, uh, was it Triple Whale or something like that? Uh, Triple Whale, is that right? They do, it's kind of like a, a dashboard that'll bring in all your uh, digital marketing. Uh, and from Triple, yeah, Triple Whale. Uh, so it brings in all, all our digital marketing into one dashboard, you know, one of those things that, that could be problematic. Um, that's super interesting to us. We actually just kind of migrated over to PostScripts for SMS. So that's been, you know, that's been exciting. Um, the Zipify stuff in the one click upsell, that's been exciting as well because, um, you know, it's, our products are pretty easy to pair with one another. So, you know, being able to have some logic in there that says, hey, they bought, they bought a bunch of plates, but they didn't buy any cutlery. You know, let's give them a deal, see if they're going to convert on some cutlery. So that's been exciting to try and, you know, better understand what customers are converting with. Um, yeah. And where are you learning about these apps? <laughs> uh, I, well, I'll jump on, on webinars that, that different vendors will use, jump on, uh, and then it's poking around in, in what other websites are doing. Like we have, you know, we're kind of always curious on what somebody else is doing. I think we generally feel that, um, you know, we maybe we don't need to always recreate the wheel. Let's see what other people are doing and see if that can work for us. Um, but it doesn't always work. Like friend buy didn't really work for us and our customers didn't really respond to it. So um, I live in a few different forums as well on, on Reddit and, and Google where people talk e-com and, and so stuff pops up in there. But oftentimes it's just like, I got a problem. I'm going to try and solve it. 
and then you find a group of people that all have the same problem and then how they've kind of you know gone about solving it as well yeah earlier you mentioned you know a group of of other retailers are those do you have like a a, a group that you can kind of ping on a regular basis or you just kind of chat retail with yeah, we have, uh, especially our, you know, our executive team, our CEO, he, he's got a lot of contacts. So we definitely hop on the phone with other brands sometimes and, and talk shop or, or do collaborations uh, to sort of combine, you know, we'll send some emails to our group, you send some emails to your customers sort of thing. So um, you know, we have a few brands that we, we know well that we kind of talk, talk about and talk, talk shop. Okay. Well, we are at, you know, we're, we're at the, the 30 minute ish mark. Uh, for you know, for our audience, we don't want to go too long here. Maybe you know, next week uh, I have uh, Matthew Seifert from Pretty Litter coming on. They do, and there it's like a subscription uh, kitty litter service. We're gonna continue the "What would you ask the next guest?" thing going. <laughs> okay. So for Matthew, is there anything you think that you could you would throw out? Uh, you would want to know, like, if he was in that group of retailers, what would you want to know? What's what he's struggling with, or what he's facing, what he's looking at, et cetera? I think one thing that I that I, I wonder, as as like a growing brand, is like you kind of you know you did a bunch of things to get from 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 zero to X, wherever you're at, right? But those things don't always necessarily work from X to two X or X to four X, right? There's you kind of so. I'm curious on like, you know, you, we, like at least that's the stuff that I'm working on now is like, we've got to, to X, um, but to get to two X, we may need to blow up what we did before. So I'm curious, like if, I guess the question would be that if you could you know, completely redo some segment of your, your business or your channel or your, your MarTech or that, and then have no consequences with that, because there's always like a, there would be a consequence in the short term. Like if you could just like flip the switch and, and, delete this and start a new like maybe what would that be like whether it's firing it you know moving on to a different agency or, or redoing how you're doing this or that you know maybe that's a complex question but you know how or what can you turn off today and, or what would you like to turn off today that maybe is unrealistic well it, it falls in line with every business is different and what works for one may not work for the other or it may work for your business you don't know until you right. test it and the, the should is a word that I often use. Uh, it's kind of a red flag word for me when everyone's like, oh, you should do this. It's like, well, it worked for your business and it worked for your business at that time. Mm -hmm. but, you know, the iOS update's a perfect example. You know, like those, any strategy associated with retargeting, building your, your audience that way, it doesn't work today anymore. So what is going to work tomorrow? What, where would you place your bet to double again next year? Where, you, where, where are you placing your bet in 20, you know, the second half of 2022 and 2023? Um, and, you know, well, I'll, I'll turn it on you. What would it be for you? Where do we place our bet? Um, I think, <clears throat> you know, with, with a bunch of new products coming down the line, you know, I think uh, I'm, betting a little bit more on, I guess, the brand and, and a bit more on some of the influencer stuff we're doing. We've seen some real positive stuff around leveraging, you know, some influencers. So I think our influencer channel will become a more profitable channel than our digital marketing spend. Um, and I think that's, that's, you know, that can be pretty profound. I think. Catherine on our team, actually speaking of influencers, she what well, she found your product through an influencer. And she was surprised that the link the influencer sent him to was her influencer Amazon store. Mm -hmm. Where she had your, you know, it's really easy to build your your story to pull the products. And so they were encouraging them to shop through Amazon versus her putting an affiliate link to you to your site. Uh, what's your view? Are you happy about that? Don't care? Prefer them to be linking to your site as we look at this influencer model? I think we prefer them to, to drive them to our, you know, our website just so that we can really kind of capture that first party data. But 
you know, at the stage of where I am on Amazon is, is at, I don't think, you know, I think I'm mostly indifferent, um, partially because what we offer on Amazon is different than what we offer on our website. The, the prices are slightly different. The, you know, they're more like full kits rather than buying individual items on Amazon. So, you know, that's, we mitigate that by trying to understand the, the economics of both channels and, and price them as such and package them as such. So uh, I don't think I can, any way we tell people we exist for now, I'm going to be happy with so. the, uh, you know, and with that influencer management, which apps would, would you, do you currently have, or that you'd love to add to help manage those influencers? I'd love to add like a grin or an affluence, um, to really kind of put that stuff in high gear for now. We've added, uh, LTK, which is like an and share sale, which is like, that's a little bit more of an affiliate, but both of those. Yeah. Um, old school Chicago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, LTK has been good so far because people can can tag us organically without us actually engaging with them. So um, that I think just when we put it on, we got a couple hundred clicks without doing anything yet. So um, you know, I think there's there's definitely something there with our type of product, with um, our type of customer. Um, people tend to do tend to convert from from that channel. So. You know, in, in the sunglass world, we work with a lot of brands and you often see the, see them pick up, you know, some famous person to have their, their line of sunglasses that they then pitch. Is that, is that an area that, that your company's looked at at all? We haven't really looked for the celebrity endorsement just yet. I, I keep pitching a Super Bowl commercial every year, but it's just, just outside the budget so far, but uh... I think for now we try to find uh, you, know, you know lower level or semi influences that kind of fit with our with our look and feel. So yeah, you know, we're still trying to to figure out exactly what our look and feel is, and you know we'll keep adjusting over time depending on how our customers are reacting. So have you you know the the micro influencer or nano influencer is is that market whether it's it's Gatsby and uh, Bretson in San Diego near you, Archive Florida. Have you looked at that? that segment yeah i think we're mostly looking some for somebody like in the 10k to 100,000 sort of follower range so that kind of gets you into the micro and then gets you some into the macro or the bigger the bigger side so uh we we work with maybe 20 to 30 different influencers now here and there and some we've used several times some are uh, some are new but um a lot of the times it's just like if they are posting kind of what our aesthetic is and they don't, even if they don't have a ton of followers, we'll still shoot them some products so they can take some images. And then uh, it's just great content to reuse, whether social or on the website. Or So I don't think we can have enough content in, in today's world. So it's, It sounds like last year was the macro influencer and this year the bet's the micro. It's just more fun to work with. You know, everybody's <laughs> excited. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, great. Well, you know, any other last shots you want to throw out here on, on your tech stack that's been gnawing at you? I mean, I think every day it's just trying to figure out how everything is working together and, and it, if it is. So it's just that aspect of, you know, getting up out of the weeds every now and then and kind of taking that 30,000 foot view, uh, whiteboard it out, make sure everything's working together. And I think at this point too, I'm, I'm, I'm not afraid to, to throw something out that maybe hasn't quite been as effective. Um, which apps, would you, what do you think is working together well today? <clears throat> I think our, uh, uh, between our digital marketing, uh, our, our just doing our pop-ups, our emails and posts in, in SMS, those are all working pretty well, especially if you look at the, um, the conversion rates associated with people that kind of go through that channel, they're much higher. And uh, <clears throat> so those, those are all working well together. Our, our review app, Judge Me, works really well at getting our, our reviews in, and then you know, we get notified if there's a low review, and that kicks off a whole other sort of chain of, of um, internal and automated stuff to, to go understand why somebody only gave us a one star, or two star, or three star, and trying to go and rectify that. Gorgeous has been really effective in making sure we don't miss any customer service elements because uh, people will message, they'll DM us, they'll Facebook us, they'll send us an email to leave us a phone call. So that's been good to sort of you know, consolidate our customer service um, 
And then the one click upsell, just trying to show people a different product offering post purchase has been really um, effective in, in keeping those AOVs up. You know, one thing I used to do thinking back is I'd look at either some top competitors, but then also other people in, the sp in retail for influence. Who, who are you, who do you go to to get, what websites do you go to for info, uh, inspiration? I look a lot of like Pure Vita. They make like bracelets. Uh, I've looked at like Retrospect. Um, they do some, some good things. I've looked at like Blenders. They're doing this kind of sunglass space. Um, yeah, they're two companies right in your backyard there. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> right down here. Uh, we'll look at like uh, other people that are in the space, like uh, Mark and Graham. They, they kind of sell charcuterie boards and stuff. And then we'll just look at, um, you know, kind of maybe some other, a few competitors that sell some stuff as well. Uh, also just poke around on Amazon and see who's kind of selling in the same space and then see what they're doing on Amazon, see what they're doing on the website. So, you know, I really need to spend like a good day, a week, just kind of seeing what everybody else is doing and making sure we're kind of keeping up. But, so with all of that, how big is your team? One person. Uh, yeah, it's me and my boss that do most of the stuff. And then um, we have you know some agencies that are doing different things for us that I'm managing here and there. But you know, we're looking to, to bring on a couple more bodies in the, sort of the D2C e-commerce space. So it, It's unbelievable how much you can achieve. I mean, not, we're not doing a lot. <laughs> I'm just yeah. here to tell you that you do so much. Because, I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, that's it's a lot to manage um and you, like you said your tech stack definitely needs to work together to try to help you get there as much as you can uh great well will thank you so much yeah no uh, problem thank you i will be uh i'll be down in san diego to see robbie sometime soon so we'll get out there's, uh, there's breweries a, yeah let's go for a sale that sounds great all right awesome all right well thank you will take care yes, take care